Y'all see that machine sitting right there? That's what I want to show y'all here. I talked to the guy that owns this thing last week. I told him, I said, I want to go over and film it. He said, knock yourself out. So y'all have heard me talk about uh, bell tree cutters in some of my videos. Well, this is a bell tree cutter right here. That is one of them. When we first, our first cut down machine that we ever got, this is what it was, the bell. These things were built in uh, South Africa and they brought them over here in the United States back in the 80s. And they were a hit. They did, they did very well. They're not a very big machine. Uh, Bell had their own series of dealers. They would come in over there at the Port of Savannah in Georgia, and then they would send them out from there is what they would do. This is gonna be one of the earlier ones, and the reason I know that is because it's got the solid, the boom is not split up there. And the first one that we ever had was a uh, 86 model we got it in 1988 and it had the solid boom on it right there too and uh after after this style right here then they started building what they called a super t and it had a split boom on it and everything So this is what the inside of it looked like. It was all levers and it had a, uh, the foot pedals in it, it drove each side individually. So you could have one tire spinning forward and the other tire spinning backwards if you wanted to. Look at that wasp nest up there in that corner up there. No guinea wasp. Waiting for me to come on up in there where they could tear me up. See, this one didn't even have air conditioning in it. This one just had fans in it. That's all I had in it. It didn't have a unit, air conditioning unit in it. Yeah. Just old metal doors. This is your throttle right there. That's what that was. This controlled your bar speed, how fast your bar come out. So you could adjust it from inside the cab in here. So this one has a uh, flip cylinder on the head right here. It's a directional felling head. See, it's got this cylinder right here and that flipped the head up where you could grab the tree. The one that we had may have been a little bit older than this one right here because ours didn't have a uh a flip cylinder on the head to flip the head up you just had kind of had to sling it at the tree and grab it and let you know grab it up kind of high because this when you pick it up this right here kind of dangled down and you caught the tree just right and then slid the head down it there They had a saw bar right there. There's a saw bar sticking out. Right there, you can see it. This one's got a short bar on it. I forget what length bar that, uh, that I used to run. But I think the head, the third machine I had, I think it would hold, I think it would run a 30 inch bar, I believe. These walls are over here on the side. They ain't gonna mess with them. See, if you can see, I'll open it here. Probably gonna swarm a little bit, but I'm gonna go ahead and open it. Now you can see you were sitting on top of the pump right there. See, there's your linkage. Look at all them guinea walls right there. There's your linkage for your foot pedal that run your tires right there for this side and there's one on the other side over there the pump just bolted straight to the 
to the engine right there. So you can imagine the amount of heat that you dealt with in one of these things right here. And it had a high and a low range on the, you could put it in high range right there if you want to go fast, move on down or something quicker. But it was pretty much a plain Jane machine, no frills, there wasn't anything really special about it. It was just a an engine and a pump and a seat. And that was pretty much it right there. Old school. And hot to run. It had a this is supposed to have a piece of uh lex sand right there in the in the front. It had it had leg sand down there at your feet down there too to keep something from flying up there. But this and here's them been, been knocked out. You you talking about uh, painful to run right here too with all that screen and everything in there. It had a Dorch air cooled oil cooled engine in it no radiator in it they just the engines were bulletproof on these things simple exhaust just went straight up through the cover right there and out right there catch on fire pretty easy too so it's starting to rain i'm gonna wrap this thing up right here was your hydraulic tank right there you poured the oil in right there and it was in the back end of the machine. This was your fuel tank right here. You put fuel in it right up there at the top. This was, the frame was the fuel tank. So I said a while ago, this was the throttle. This is your keel right here. This is not the way it's supposed to be. It had a lever that came through there to attach right there on the, if you can see it through the screen right there. I can't open it, but, so you could blow this thing out. You took his cover off right there blowed air through the fins to blow the cylinder heads out and then that that was the uh hydraulic oil cooler right there sitting right there but it, it pulled air through this little fan right there blew it through the cylinder head jugs and it came up through there through that black hose and in through there you could take those two bolts out and access that to blow through there but you can see you the engine was sitting in your back right there the machine was very loud but they would cut some trees man they would uh they would roll through some timber the uh the problem with them was is as our timber started getting thicker and started getting really brushy and everything the machine wasn't very suitable for brush at all. It, it didn't. They didn't do real good in brush. See, they didn't even have Lexan in them. That's got plexiglass in the back up back there. They were real easy to catch on fire. The uh, all the leaves and stuff would drop back here on the back right there with your where your muffler's sitting, and they'd catch on fire pretty quick if you didn't pay attention to them. They didn't hold much fuel. It, well, I forget how much they were, but as far as fuel-wise went, but it, you could run all day on it. I think these early models, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say this one was probably an 87 model. The one that we have was an 86, cause this one's got some newer stuff on it that ours didn't have, like the flip-up cylinder. This was just a one-way cylinder with a drift down on it when you let off the hydraulics on it it would just kind of drift back down they run a uh, 404 pitch chain on them is what they ran on them too point that out but this cylinder up here ran in float mode or you could lock it to but they were very very strong machines extremely strong machines man they, you could cut whatever you could grab you could cut it i mean it didn't matter i cut some trees that were 50 inches in diameter with them you had to multiple cut them you know cut around the tree to cut them to get them to fall on the ground and all but it didn't matter if you could grab it you could cut it with the darn thing and then 
it wouldn't hold the tree so when you cut it off it was falling you know but just some tough things to run they were tough during the summertime and if you got in some uh uh, there's a couple other things that made them tough if you got in some yellow jackets or you knocked a hornet's nest down uh in one that didn't have an air conditioner in it like this one you were toast in there you pretty much got the smoke down on your time you tried to get away from it and and get out of it but i think these machines when they first came out over here in the united states uh they ran somewhere around forty thousand or so brand new may have been a little less than that then when they went to the Super T's, probably about 89 or 90 when they started going to the split boom on them, they got up around $60,000. And the last one that we bought, uh, I think it was 80 something thousand is what it was. But they also built these things that had a set of uh, high tracks on them, like a bulldozer on the front. They didn't even have a tail wheel on the back of them. They'd climb anything. But these right here, you had to run them with uh, tire chains on them. They won't hardly do anything without tire chains on them. You really needed to run them with tire chains. So that's that. And, of course, you can see all the hoses on there, just two-wire hoses. They didn't run no pressure on these things hardly what was on these they wasn't high pressure machines or anything so that's that hope y'all enjoyed that little trip down memory lane got a bell tree cutter also this same guy here owns a uh, one of our old apprentice loaders too and so uh, he told me i could go film it also so i'm gonna run by i can't remember if it's my old loader if it's the one that kevin ran uh, but i'm gonna uh, film it too uh and one other thing to note uh they were built in africa and i think they were initially built to run in sugarcane fields is what they were and if you notice the directional head on it there uh looks just like the current directional heads that you see on a lot of machines they're just bigger like the war tiles and stuff like that so i'm about to head on to the house we'll catch y'all later later taters so a couple other things here to talk about too. When we bought the second machine, well, the first one we bought it in 88 and then the second one that we bought, we bought it in 93, I believe. And when we bought it, we bought it with a, uh, it came with the directional head. And then we also bought a shear head. You actually had quick connects on the hydraulic lines. So you could pop them loose, pull two pins out Put that shear head on there. It's about a 16 inch shear, and you could walk the dog with it in uh, real small stuff, you know, just just shearing it off. So when I say shear, it's not like the guys in Louisiana. They call every tree cutter a shear over there, but it actually pinched the trees off, and you could, I mean, if you did it right, you could cut off 18, 19 inch tree with it. You had to work with it to, to get it. You'd have to cut it on both sides, and it would hold the tree up too. And it had an accumulator arm on it, so you could accumulate you know, four or five small pine trees in it and then, and then throw them down. So we bought that machine in 93 and we had, uh, we, it was joysticks. It actually, it was a Bell Ultra T is what they called it, I believe. And it had joysticks in it. Still kind of, you know, it wasn't really anything special. It was just like this machine, except it was, it was cabbed in. It had air conditioner. The air conditioner was kind of so-so, but it didn't keep the dust out. One of the big things that they uh, said was it had a pressurized cab in it, and it it wasn't pressurized. It didn't it didn't work that way. It didn't keep the dust out. But that was the first one of those joystick machines that they had in the United States, and we bought it. And they didn't have it nowhere near perfected yet, so we kept it for a little while. And we had an incredible amount of trouble with it. I mean, we we put uh, 34s on it, on the on the tires. It had 34-inch wide tires on it. The same ones that Firestone still build today. And we went round and round with Bell on that, on that thing for about a year, I guess, or so. 
And Bell finally decided that they would just send us a brand new one. And they had a, um, they brought it up from the port. It didn't come through the dealer or nothing like that. It came straight to us on a truck. We took, the deal was we were going to keep our tires off of it. So what we did was is we pulled the tires, the, the big, the 34s off, I pulled them off, set the machine on the ground. I took my, uh, let's see, Kevin, we was running a 410D loader at that time. We put chains on, hooked it to the top of that thing. We took that 410 and we picked that bail up and we set it on the trailer without the tires on it and then uh, just stacked the, the, the 23 inch wide tires behind it to where the truck driver could run after dark to get back down to Savannah with that, with that machine that they were going to take back. Um, so we ended up with a brand new bell. And then I ran that machine from then until 97. So I ran a bell from 88 to 97. I was still in high school in 88 and 89 but I was still cutting a lot of trees, you know, after school and on the weekends and then during the summer. And so from 88 to 97, that's what I cut with was one of those bell tree cutters. Now think about this loading on low boy. What you had to do was, is you would, you'd back up there and back at that tail wheel up one ramp and then turn it real quick and line your tires up and back on up on the trailer. And then when you drove off, you just, drove off of it and held the tail wheel up in the air till you got down and you could sit down. You could, you could make a tail wheel pick up in the air at any given time that you wanted to. And now for you ask this too, you could turn the machine over just like that. It, it took absolutely nothing to turn that machine over. You could blow on it the wrong way and it would turn over. You could run in a hole with it and it would turn over. The, there's no telling how many times I turned a bell tree cutter over while I was running it. I remember one day I turned it over three times and one day I was actually being pulled out with a skitter one day. I got it stuck. Got the skitter hooked to me. I was in the machine. The skitter was pulling me out and he he pulled me over a stump and flipped me over and was dragging me on my side. He didn't even know he done turn me over until he turned he turned around and seen me seen the machine laying on the side. Never heard it or anything. He just hooked to it, snatched it back over fired it back up, it smoked like crazy and keep right on rolling. So just the, the one thing that saved those machines, what made them sell so well in the United States in those late eighties was, was they were trying to come out, Coring was trying to come out with a saw head cutter and they got it, they got it out. The problem was, was the saw head cutter cost about three times what the bell cost and the disc wasn't no good on them. So the, the disc, they had, when they were developing those saw heads, it took them a little while to get the metal right in them to where they wouldn't crack. Because the first ones they ever built, they cracked, the disc cracked like crazy. But man, once they got that figured out, got the, the disc perfected on them things, it was goodbye bell. They were, they were over with then. And so I don't even know if you can, I'm sure you can probably still get parts for them. I have no idea where you'd have to go to get parts for them, but um, it's kind of weird going back and looking at that machine up close because I have not been around one of those machines since 1997 and very weird walking up to it, looking at it because it's just like, I just got out of it yesterday and and I hate it, and I still hate bars and chains today because of those things right there. They were so aggravating, especially in brush. So uh, I've been wanting to do this video for a while, and I happened to see that guy last week and told him I wanted to go by there and see if I if he cared. And he said, no, I'll go do it. So I did. So there you go. I'll get by there, and I'll film that other loader. I'm pretty sure that that other loader, when I walk up to it, I'll know whose it was. I'm pretty sure it's Kevin's old loader, the 410E, because I think mine went to somebody else when we sold it. But I'll get by and I'll film uh, that old 410 loader where you can kind of see it and what have you. But uh, I appreciate y'all watching and tuning in to all this. If you have any questions, ask them down below and I'll try to keep up with them. And, 
and uh, get them answered there. But they were good machines. They were just plain as could be, brutal to run, hot to run. Because I think that Dorch engine, it runs a lot hotter than a normal diesel engine does. I want to think that thing ran about 230 degrees or something like that. But they had a temperature gauge in it. That one didn't have it in there. It was going out of it. You had to really pay attention to that temperature gauge in there because it was really easy to heat that thing up because if you started getting a lot of fiber going into those cylinder jugs on that blowing through it, uh, you'd have to come out and you'd have to blow it out. And, and rough, the machine was extremely rough to run to you. Very, very, it, it beat you. There was no suspension, uh, no suspension on the seat. The seat was mounted straight to that cover on top of the pumps right there. So everything you did, every bump, you felt it in that machine. It was it was crazy. <laughs> so we'll catch y'all later. Later, taters.